November 1983, six armed robbers slipped into a maximum security warehouse near Heathrow, hoping to steal over a million pounds in cash. I thought to myself, well, you know, are they going to just take the goods and go, or are they going to kill us at the same time? They poured the petrol down over my chest, and I was told in no uncertain terms, if the alarms went off, or well, the police turned up, they put a match to me and put a bullet through the back of my head. What they got away with was gold bullion worth a staggering 26 million. But how did they do it? This is the brutal story of the Brinks Map bullion heist and the hunt for the missing gold. ever armed robbery was carried out at the Brinks Mat security depot at Heathrow, the gang escaped with £26 million worth of gold bars, weighing nearly three tonnes. This was a huge amount of gold, almost uh, conquistador uh, proportions. To give some sort of perspective, it was the weight of two average family saloon motor cars. The biggest ever robbery in British criminal history had already begun. One of the most begun. audacious robberies ever carried out in Britain. On defence, £26 million worth of gold stolen in Britain's biggest ever it must robbery. must have been a large and well-organised operation. To be honest, I was in complete fear of my life and also the lives of my colleagues, especially when they tell you where you live and then they tell you how to get into your own vault. And that is the most scary part of it. They knew so much. They took with them the secret of where the hall is hidden. But of course, by stealing the gold, the robbers then had a problem of how to actually filter that gold back into the system and make that gold turn into cash. Ruthless in its conception, fearless in its operation, the Brinks Mat heist is still the largest bullion robbery in British criminal history. In just 15 minutes, a highly organised South London gang of armed robbers made off with three tonnes of gold from the Fort Knox style warehouse near Heathrow. It was the biggest crime or robbery that I've ever been involved in. And dare I say it, it was a watershed crime in the criminal history of, of this country. Saturday morning in November 1983, the start of the early morning shift at the Brinks Mat Warehouse. Security supervisor Mike Scouse had to wait until precisely 6.30 a.m. to open the doors to his team of security guards. Robin Risley, Richard Holliday, Peter Bentley and Ron Clark. Being based at Heathrow Airport, we handled a lot more high value goods we handled banknotes, we also handled uh, diamonds, gold bars, precious metals, and anything of high value. <coughs> Every day was different. Some days it was uh, pennies, other days it was millions. When you pick up, say, five million pounds, it doesn't register as five million pounds. To be honest, you didn't worry about the value. Uh, you worried more about the pound in your back pocket because the pound in your back pocket belonged to you. Once in, the security guards went about their normal duties. One of the lads was making the tea, uh, as per usual, and uh, the others were getting their bits and pieces together, security equipment, etc. We then got the various books out and the keys, and uh, we started to discuss what was going on. We're going through the airway bills and sort of just doing a rough calculation, and we realised there was an awful lot of gold to be moved that morning and the vehicle that had been allocated couldn't really take the weight, it was just over three tonne. The gold had been delivered to the warehouse in 76 stacked boxes on pallets shortly after the security guards had clocked off work the night before. It was a staggering amount they were expected to handle that day. The doorbell went at about 20 to 7, so I then went downstairs and saw Tony Black outside. He was on his own. So I opened up the door. Not for the first time, a fifth member of security, Tony Black, arrived 10 minutes late. 
he looked a little bit dishevelled, like he'd just got out of bed. Um, his timekeeping wasn't one of the best. No sooner he was upstairs, he said, oh, he's done dying to go to the loo. I'm going downstairs. I'm going downstairs. As Mike Scars busied himself in the radio room trying to figure out how best to transport the gold to the airport, the other security guards were gearing themselves up for the task ahead, but they were all about to have their peace shattered. Tony Black joined me. He was rolling a cigarette. And uh, all of a sudden, there's uh, an almighty commotion going on. Next thing, this voice said, uh, on the floor. And I looked round, and there was a, a guy with a trilby hat on, with a gun. And I thought, well, what the hell are you doing here? And a hood, or bag, was placed over the head. Uh, I was then asked to put the hands behind the back, and the handcuffs were put on quite hard. And then I just laid there. I could hear these tables and chairs being kicked over. And then I just turned round, and there's this man running at me with a ski-type balaclava mask on, holding a semi-automatic pistol in his hand. He was yelling at me in no uncertain terms to get down, get down on the floor. And that's when I looked at Tony Black and I just said, who the blankety blank's he? Then next minute, we're both on the floor. I'm handcuffed, hooded, got a good kick in as well. Robin Risley was also getting a similar treatment, but why had the gang singled these two out? Brink's Mat was no ordinary warehouse. It was one of the most secure buildings in Britain, containing three of the world's toughest safes. To get to them once inside the warehouse, it was necessary to pass through a locked and alarm vault door using two sets of keys and combination numbers, and then through a gate. Once inside the vault, the safes could only be opened by a further set of keys and combination numbers. The building was protected by several alarm systems. No single employee of Brinks Mat knew which keys and which combination of numbers deactivated all the doors or alarm systems. But these robbers knew exactly who they needed to get to the cash. I think I was able to get my combination to work. Robin wasn't. He gave me his combination and I still couldn't get it off, so then he was forced to do it. They then sat me on the metal box, and one man forcibly holding me down with a gun in my ear. You could hear sort of muffled uh, voices downstairs, but again, I, I assumed that it must have been Michael and Robin with the uh, robbers, because they're the, the, the two most important people in the depot on that morning. I didn't really know what was going on. The codes were changed regularly and without warning, so Scars and Risley were often required to memorise their half of new combination numbers. Well, inside the vaults, we'd got three smaller safes. Uh, they had a combination number and a key. I had the key and Robin had the combinations, but they'd only just recently been changed and he couldn't remember them. So I could hear matches being struck because Robin had also got petrol on him and I'm sitting soaked in petrol myself. With their patience at breaking point, the robbers were unaware of the huge fortune sat right before their very eyes in the 76 stacked boxes. Instead, they were intent on the three large safes containing over a million pounds in cash. But Risley was in a panic and simply couldn't remember the combination. I was trying to defuse the situation, so I called out, leave my loan, it's like that during the week. Uh, with that comment, I was told to have him well shut up, and I was forced back on the metal box, and the gun was forcibly put into my ear, and I was told, shut up and stay there. The robbers were getting angrier. Things were just not going according to plan. At that point, they looked around to see what else they could take but the robbers were about to commit a crime that would rewrite British criminal history. Six highly organised armed robbers had come determined to steal around a million pounds in cash from the Brinks Mat warehouse. 
Instead, they were about to commit the biggest bullion robbery in British history. They knew so much. Uh, to be honest, I could have written down the combination numbers, given them the keys, and set upstairs and had a cup of tea. They told me how to get into my own vault. They were very well practiced in what they did. Uh, it was a military type operation, driven by adrenaline and armed as well. The criminal uh, world in London in the 80s was uh, highly organized. They had uh, a distinct hierarchy of criminal and those type of criminals that were committing armed robbery uh, on an organized scale were top of the tree. There's a lot of uh shouting going on inside the vaults, and then they obviously found the gold bullion that was there. Having violently terrorised the guards, they stumbled across 6,800 pure gold ingots, each weighing just under 400 grams, and each bar worth around 3,000 pounds. The haul was getting on for three tonnes, with a value in the region of 26 million pounds. Now, the gold was inside the vaults. It was on pallets. So then they said, who can open the shutters to let a vehicle in? And I said, Tony Black. Black was ordered to open the shutter doors as a vehicle drove in. The pallets stacked with bullion were quickly loaded onto the vans. I was lying there. I had no idea what they'd come for. And then all of a sudden, all you heard was bang, bang, bang. And I thought, oh, my God, they're taking the gold. I still didn't know at the end of the day whether we would all live or die. And um, I just said to one of them, you load it a bit quicker than we do. And I was just told in no uncertain terms to shut it. And all of a sudden, we heard this voice saying, uh, thanks ever so much for your help and have a very nice Christmas. As the engine noise slowly faded into the distance, the guards were left with nothing but silence. I then gave it a couple of minutes, then I called out to all the lads and all of them answered, so I knew that they were all alive and in one piece sort of thing. And then uh, one of the lads um, was able to break his handcuffs, the link on it, and th then he kicked a very large hole in the office door and then he came into me. I then heard, uh, I think, released Tony Black, and then they got some uh, a screwdriver and a hammer, and uh, then they broke my handcuffs. All of a sudden, this voice said, uh, "Keep keep away from the door, look out!" And this uh, size 12 boot came smashing through the door, followed by a head, and it was uh, Peter uh, checking if we were okay. With the alarm raised, a flying squad team led by Detective Inspector Tony Brightwell raced to Brink's man. The scene at the warehouse itself, it was in total disarray. There was uh, upturned chairs, there were masks, uh, gags, um, ropes lying all over the place. There was an unbelievable stench of petrol, where petrol had been poured over the guards. Um, the whole thing were, uh, was in disarray. I should point out that the robbers had, had carried out this robbery and got away from the premises in a matter of 15 to 20 minutes. This was high-speed stuff. Crime such as this cannot happen unless you have someone working for you on the inside. Now, that could be someone that was on duty at that time. It could be another person in the employee of, of Brinksmat, or it could be someone that's left the company. But it's right to say that even in the first minutes of us being informed of this crime, we were focusing on an inside agent. As far as the other guards are concerned, uh, and specifically Michael Scouse, it's fair to say that they were regarded from the early moments as being involved. Until they can actually uh, get a suspect or charge a suspect, then basically all six of us were suspects. Well, being the key man, not only did I have some of the combinations and the keys, I also had some of the passwords for the alarm companies. So I was number one suspect, if you like. Their houses were searched, certain items would have been taken. 
they would have been interrogated quite forcibly to see if, if they were involved. They were put through the, the hoop, make no mistake about it. Instead of being taken to the hospital, I was taken up to Hounslow Police Station, where they took off all my clothing for forensics. Scouse was under investigation for several days, and it culminated in the flying squad arresting him on suspicion of being involved in this robbery. One would ask me a question, and then I would try and answer it. And then one of the others would jump in and said, five minutes ago, you said. So then my brain would start to backtrack. What did I say five minutes ago? Somebody had set me up. And that was what was at the back of my mind. Who's done it? Just as it was looking like Scarce was in the frame, another man had now come to the attention of the police. Very quickly, we made a connection with a man called Black, who was one of the guards on duty that day. His sister was living with and was the common law wife of a man called Robinson, who was very high up in the criminal underworld of South London, was a suspected armed robber, was an organised criminal of, of high standing. But the police needed evidence to prove Tony Black was the inside man. We decided to reconstruct the events, getting each guard in turn to go through their story, but without being able to collaborate with their colleagues. There were numerous flaws in Tony Black's story, that he was claiming to have seen things taking place which he could not possibly have done so. Now, whilst filming this, we, unknown to Black, went through his jacket, which he'd hung over a chair, and removed a personal diary. And we photocopied this diary. This was to become important later. I was assigned to actually interview Black concerning his uh, activities or his involvement on that particular morning. The sequence of events as we built up to the actual golden question, if you like, which was, how often do you see your brother-in-law, Brian Robinson? And at that stage, we introduced his diary which at that time was totally different to what it had been two or three days beforehand. Black had tried to disguise his involvement by falsifying his diary entries, but the police were on to him. The cracks were beginning to show as he was made to stew in his cell, but would he tell the truth? Meanwhile, news at the heist had already made headlines around the world. The story shook the global gold market. The hunt for the missing bullion was well underway, but would the gold disappear without a trace? A gang of six armed robbers had pulled off Britain's biggest heist with an incredible gold bullion haul of 26 million pounds, stolen from one of Britain's most impenetrable buildings the Brinks Mac warehouse. With the inside man reaching breaking point, the police were now on the trail for the missing gold. Each ingot is serially numbered. The only way that you can move those ingots is first, you have to melt them to get rid of any identifying marks. But then you have to mix it in a certain way with copper, with coin, brass in order to disguise it even further, because the only way that gold is acceptable, really, coming back into the market, which has to happen here, is if it's sold into the market as scrap gold. 15 days after the robbery, the police got a major tip-off. A man would pick up a smelter from a manufacturer in Worcester capable of melting 36 kilos of gold bullion at any one time. The police set about following the smelter, but managed to lose track of it. It was a huge blow to the operation. Back at Scotland Yard headquarters,
the police were piling the pressure on Black. £26 million worth of gold had been stolen and they desperately needed a confession. It was a very difficult case um, and really hinged on turning one man, which was Black. So later that evening, when we brought him out of the cell again, we saw a totally different Tony Black. It was then that he said, I want to tell you the truth. The flying squad now had their man. Black was about to blow the lid on the biggest bullion robbery in history. Tony Black was a very average type of guy. I would say that he was easily led, easily impressed, but nothing really outstanding about him at all. He always came over as quite a, an affable type of person. Uh, if you had any problems on your car, he used to fix it for you. He'd only met a few people that he, he knew or could identify regarding this, the planning of this robbery, which had taken several months. It transpired that Robinson had introduced him to a man called Michael McAvoy and a man called Tony White. So he used to meet under the guise of going fishing at Leyland on the River Thames. Black had told them how many guards would be on duty, where they would be at any particular time, where the safes were, who the guards were that had the combination numbers to get into these safes. Explicit detail, detail without which you couldn't possibly have carried out this crime. To so the day of the robbery, Black had overslept and panicked that he couldn't get to the warehouse in time so he was late arriving for work. And in fact, he had met the robbers as they waited to get into the premises. Prior to the armed robbers bursting through the door, he had excused himself and gone downstairs to the, to the toilet. He obviously, at that time, was helping the robbers into the premises. Tony Black had committed the ultimate betrayal putting the lives of his colleagues on the line. I was still in bed because of my blisters, I couldn't do anything. And I was out of bed, television on, and I sat there and I shook and I shook and I shook. I was absolutely shocked. Uh, the legs went. I managed to stand upright. I don't know how, but I, was, I managed to stay upright. And looking back now, I felt sick at that time, more sick than I did on the day of the robbery. With the help of the newly recruited police supergrass, Tony Black, detectives were now certain of some of the key players. Brian Robinson, early 40s, the criminal mastermind, otherwise known as the Colonel. Mickey McAvoy, late 30s, five foot eight, and leader of the attack team. Tony White, close on 40, foot soldier, built to cause trouble, serious trouble. This was a highly organized gang, or gangs that were carrying out these robberies. They were all known to each other. People knew that this gang had done that particular job, and that person had been behind that particular job. So, in terms of professional crime, it was known to the police that Robinson and McAvoy were heavily involved in armed robbery. Whilst Robinson, McAvoy and White were arrested and questioned by the police, the pressure was on detectives to find the missing gold. Seven months after the robbery, the police got another breakthrough when a man by the name of Kenneth James Noy was brought to their attention they were back on the gold trail. Kenneth Noy was the mastermind and the controller of how the gold uh, could be turned into cash. We believe that Mr Noy came on the scene very shortly after the robbery, if indeed he didn't actually know that the robbery was going to take place. Noy was another high-ranking wealthy criminal with an established background in money laundering. Noy had travelled to Jersey and had purchased 11 gold bars, exactly the same weight as the gold bars that had been stolen from the Brinks Mat robbery. Each gold bar purchased in that way comes with a certificate of ownership 
and each bar is serially numbered. Those bars never left Jersey. Thank you. Pleasure doing business. Thank you. Bye-bye. But what Noy was obviously doing was buying those gold bars to get the documentation that went with those gold bars so that he could move 11 gold bars from the bullion robbery around at any one time without raising suspicion should he be questioned or stopped. Despite Noy's best efforts to avoid any suspicion, he was very much on the flying squad's radar. Undercover police officers were watching Noy having secret meetings with a man called Brian Reader. Reader was calling at Noy's premises on an on a almost daily basis. And every time these two met, we ascertained that a very heavy bag was going from Noy to Reader. Now, my team worked on this for several days and eventually followed Reader to Hatton Garden. From there, they saw the same banks being taken down to Bristol to a company called Scadlin. It was their job to then mix it with base metal, copper, brass, to give it the appearance, if they could, of scrap gold and then sell it on the open market. And invariably, in this case particularly, a lot of this gold actually ended up back with Johnson Mathe, the people that originally lost the gold in the first place. Ironically, the gold was being sold back to the company it had been stolen from. Now the police investigation needed to find out how the gold was reaching Noy. Was it coming from one or more sources, or did Noy already have all the gold? With Tony Black now on board as a police supergrass, they lent on him to reveal more. We asked him, where would the gold have gone to? Had you met any of the robbers in between us arresting you a week later and the robbery itself and he said no and I believed him. It was counterproductive for the robbers to actually meet him after the event. They wouldn't necessarily tell him where they'd stashed the gold. Instead, Black's first test as a police supergrass was to come in the form of an ID parade. Black would have to go and touch the likes of McAvoy on the shoulder and identify him as being involved in the Brinks Matt robbery. And as Black approached him to touch him on the shoulder, he hit Black full in the face. Now that was intimidation. But thankfully, Black came through that. Black then went on to identify Robinson and White in separate lineups. Black was sent to trial at the Old Bailey. He was sentenced to six years in prison for his part in the Brinks Matt heist. He then testified eight months later along with Mike Scouse against Robinson, McAvoy and White, who had pleaded not guilty at the Old Bailey for the armed robbery of Brinks Matt. It was, it was very tense in there. They were only a few feet away. Uh, they were surrounded by police officers and prison officers. I think they were trying to stare me out. The jury found Robinson and McAvoy guilty, sentencing each of them to 25 years in prison. I, I was quite pleased that they got a long sentence because um, the amount of violence and what they were capable of to myself and uh, to the rest of the crew, um, they got what they deserved, to be honest. But the jury weren't convinced of Tony White's involvement. Tony White was acquitted by a hair's whisker. And whiskers are the right word to use because his involvement came down to whether he had a beard on a particular day when he met Black. The jury chose to believe his version of events and he was acquitted. With three of the criminals banged up, but still no gold, the police were under huge pressure but what was about to happen next would have the most shocking impact on their investigation. Our 
After the conviction of gang leaders Robinson, McAvoy and Supergrass Tony Black, Scotland Yard detectives desperately needed to track the missing gold. They had already established that from Kenneth Noy's house in West Kingsdown, Kent, Brian Reader was collecting the gold and delivering it to a small office in Hatton Gardens, London. From there, the gold was being transported down to Bedminster, near Bristol, to a small bullion company called Scadlin, where it was bought, smelted and resold back to the open market as scrap gold. Now, a huge amount of cash, obviously, would be generated by disposing of this amount of gold. Scadlin, obviously, would have to pay for this gold. And they were a very small operation in a very small suburb stroke village on the outskirts of Bristol. In a six-month period between August 1984 and January 1985, Scadlin had disposed of a staggering 13 million pounds in gold. They'd risen from the verge of bankruptcy to one of the primary dealers outside the main Johnson & Matthew in scrap gold. So this was a huge amount of business running through this very small company because Scadlin have to pay for this gold. And the money then goes back to Noy and is disseminated to the various interested parties and criminals whose gold it belongs to. Now, in order to do that, they relied on a very small bank, a local bank, a branch bank, and this bank had to generate large amounts of cash on almost a daily basis. So in order to assist this or facilitate this, the bank had to send to London to get vast or large injections of cash to their operation in Bedminster, Bristol. We found out that a lot of this money was brand new 50 pound notes. The A24 series of brand new 50 pound notes. Knowing these 50 pound notes were directly linked to the gold, all the police had to do now was to determine how the gold was reaching Noy in the first place. A decision was taken in the higher echelons of Scotland Yard to insert officers into Noy's premises to discover if Noy had any other gold buried or hidden in his grounds or on his premises. We had to enlist the help of rural SAS trained officers. Detective constables Neil Murphy and John Fulgham were put on the operation. John and myself arrived about 5 p.m., um, got ourselves um, ready to spend a whole night at the property if necessary. We were expecting Reader to arrive at Noy's house that night. We were expected to witness the handover of gold. And we were given the um, signal to enter the property. We're over the wall and into the property, uh, John and myself together. And uh, as trained, moving slowly through, through the garden up towards the property. And when we just about got to the sort of area we'd want to be where we could observe the cars, and perhaps the doors, um, we were surprised by the dogs. Little did they know that noise free Rottweiler dogs were loose on the ground. Afraid the dogs were going to blow their cover, Neil Murphy decided they should call a stop to the operation for that night. I gave John a nod and uh, I started to move away to leave the property. And. Uh, when I got to the fence, which was about 20 yards away, I climbed up using a tree. I was able to climb up onto the fence, and I knew once I'd dropped down the other side, I was totally safe. Uh, I assumed John had done something very similar and was uh, somewhere else on the property. We, didn't want, we couldn't talk to each other on the radio because we didn't want to make any, any noise. And um, I paused for a few seconds while I was on the fence, looked back towards where, we, where I last saw John and the torches were in that area, and the dogs were still barking. So I, um, I shouted, trying to, just trying to get Noy and Reader to make the decision to leave. I shouted at them to shut the dogs up, uh, pretending to be one of the neighbours of, of the properties where I was standing next to. And then the torch started to come my way a little bit, come towards me, so because of that, uh, I made the decision to leave the property, and I jumped down into the garden and made my way back towards the front of the property. 
Murphy had aborted the mission, but something was wrong. There was no sign of his colleague. I got in a position where I, where I could best see what was happening, and I could see two men standing over someone who was obviously on the ground. One of them shouted something about blowing your head off, and it was at that point that I realised this is a shotgun he's got. And I transmitted that to, um, to the guys listening, and the signal was given immediately then to enter the property. With their surveillance operation blown, the flying squad burst onto noise grounds. One, one of the officers uh, from the flying squad and, and uh, one of the officers who, who we'd taken over from, one of the surveillance officers, were looking after John and, uh, and one of the guys told me, looks like he's been stabbed. And I remember saying to the ambulance that, um, you know, well, he's breathing. And I, I was actually feeling very positive. But the ambulance man said, no, it's, he's not breathing. It's uh, the oxygen we're giving him is pushing his, his chest out, uh, doing the breathing for him. Um, we were in like a waiting room at the, in the casualty at the, at the hospital. One of the senior officers came into the room and, and told us that and John had died. That's how we, we found out. John Fordham died of 11 stab wounds after a ferocious attack. Kenneth Noy was arrested at the scene. Rita was arrested fleeing from the property. But from the police point of view, simply because of his professionalism, he was a, a huge loss. And there was a big empty hole. Um, I don't know. Can't talk about that. I mean, everyone was obviously devastated at the death of DC Fordham. And the whole inquiry, if you like, had been turned on its head as a result. With Noy in police custody, his house and grounds were searched. Ten hours later, an officer found the evidence they really needed to link Noy to the Brinks Map bullion. We did find 11 gold bars on the doorstep. Um, pure gold that had been uh, obviously melted and recast prior to them going to Bristol. At the time, the 11 gold bars were worth around £100,000. What was left was to now take action against all the people that we knew were involved in disposing of our gold. Within 24 hours, various premises in the Bristol area, in London, were raided by hundreds of officers who came in to assist at that particular time. And we had to secure what evidence was left to us. But significantly, very significantly, the one pieces of evidence that we did find were A24 series 50 pound notes, which we knew had come from Scadlin. With noise property raided and the gold and 50 pound notes found on his premises, D.I. Brightwell turned his attention to questioning Noy. Immediately, um, Noy engaged me in a, a Masonic hand signal. Um, and I recognised this. And I looked at him and thought immediately to myself that here is a man that's trying to ingratiate himself with me thinks that I'll be able to help him and is obviously looking to do business, as it were. In ordinary circumstances, if John Fulham had not been killed, I would have been delighted to talk to this guy, to do a deal, as it were, with him, um, because he knew where the gold was coming from. But I knew, because a copper had been killed, that there was no way that this could happen. And as soon as he learned of my feelings on that, he really showed a different side of himself. But I could see the aggression building in him. With no deal struck, the police found it almost impossible to get any more information on the gold trail. Ten months later, Noyes stood trial at the Old Bailey for the murder of DC John Fordham. I knew that Noy had probably one of the best criminal barristers that I've ever um, 
come up against in my time in the police. I understand that the jury were taken down a Hollywood cottage at night to replicate these conditions and basically put the question to them, how would you react if you'd have confronted someone as John Fordham was, dressed in black, blacked out face, in the middle of the night? How would you have reacted? Would you have acted in self-defence? And the jury chose to go down that route where they agreed it was self-defence and acquitted him of murder. John Fordham, when all said and done, was unarmed. As I've always said, the 11 stab wounds is not self-defense. That's a frenzied attack. It was a confident Noy who strolled back into the old Bailey five months after his acquittal for the murder of John Fordham. This time, he was facing charges for handling the Brinks Map bullion and a second charge of conspiracy to evade VAT. Would Noy be able to walk free this time? First and foremost, we have to convince the jury that this gold is from the Brinks map robbery. And we do that by proving that it's fine gold, i.e. the 4 nines gold, 99.99% gold. Now, once you've done that, you're halfway there to proving circumstantially that this gold, although the numbers have been obliterated from it and any identifier mark taken off it, must have come from the bullion robbery. But the real clincher for me was the A24 series notes, because after his arrest, it gave us time to look at the accumulated wealth of people like Noy and other associates. They all linked together through these A24 series notes. The jury found Kenneth Noy guilty, both of conspiracy to handle Brinks Mac Gold and VAT fraud. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. The only saving grace through the whole thing was the fact that he was convicted of handling the gold. Um, I think if he'd walked free from court on that, having killed John, that would have been devastating. When I was told that um, he'd been convicted of, of handling the gold at least um, and got the maximum sentence of 14 years, I was delighted to hear that. In fact, I was shaking, just shaking with trembling with excitement that at last he had his comeuppance and he, he was going away. Scadlin boss Garth Chapel was sentenced to 10 years, whilst Brian Reader was jailed for nine. But despite years of police work, the greatest unanswered question of the heist still remains. What happened to the rest of the gold? We knew that the chances of us ever recovering any more gold were minimal because our lines of inquiry uh, regarding gold and how it was getting to Noy's house unfortunately had died with John Fordham and there was no way that we could re, uh, reconstitute that investigation. The whole, the route would now be dead and buried. The gold may have gone, but for those involved, the scars still remain. The only place I ever imagined that I would be involved in the robbery would be outside doing the, what we would call a bank move. Uh, I never once imagined a robbery would take place at the depot. Well, I say that was my second, I had another two after that. And then in the end, I thought it was time to get out before I was carried out feet first. You sit there and you look around people and you think, even after the robbery, I mean, the guys that were here then, you look around and you think, can I trust you? Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, Tony Black is a scum of the earth for what he did to myself and to my colleagues, but also our families, and I hope he rots in hell. The only thoughts I have are, are for John's family. I think of them quite a lot and how they've missed all the years that they, have, um, they haven't had with him. As far as recovery of the gold was concerned, the 11 gold bars found at Kenneth Noy's house was the only gold ever recovered from the bullion robbery. Now that's 11 gold bars out of 6,800 gold bars. 13 million of gold was disposed of. But that's only half. So it's pure conjecture what happened to the other half. 
A few say large amounts of bullion were flown out of the UK. Others think the bulk of it is still hidden in Britain. But some believe anyone who bought gold jewellery in the UK after November 1983 could be wearing the Brinks Mac Gold.